So thank you for coming. It's a little nerve-wracking to follow the ACM Turing Award winner. <laughs> Note to self, don't do that again. <laughs> You're like such an imposter. <laughs> so I have, um, my talk is a little bit of the four speakers we've heard so far today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, historical things that have happened in the past, as, as Barbara did. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what my group is working on, such as Wolfgang did, and then I'm going to pose a few technical problems um, within my group, uh, similar to what John did. I'm not going to make any predictions. I thought Madonna was going to be a big flop. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm not good at predictions, so I'm going to avoid what uh, Andy did. That was, that was very brave. Um, so uh, I'm going to start uh, with a little bit of history on wireless sensor networks and then get into the research that my group is doing with wireless sensors uh, in the Smart Geo uh, program. So I think everyone in this room heard of Moore's Law, right? Raise your hand. Yes, Moore's Law. Yes, okay. Who's heard of Bell's Law? Alexander or Gordon? <laughs> Actually, I don't know. That's a good question. So let me tell you the law, then you can tell me whether it's, yeah. Um, no, Gordon, I'm sure. This law was formed in 1972 area, a corollary to um, Moore's Law. And what the law states is that a new computer class is formed approximately every decade. And you can define that computer class either on hardware or on user interface or on networking. But we see, we will see every decade approximately a whole new computer class gets formed. And when you think about the history since this uh, law uh, was, was proclaimed, we have seen some pretty big changes approximately every decade in our um, systems, in these computer classes. So for example, in the 1960s, we had these big mainframes as Andy was talking about. This is a picture of the IBM 360, so we had these very large mainframes. In the 70s, we moved to the, quote, mini computer. <laughs> you know, certainly not by today's standards at all. You know, this mini, com mini computer was still uh, bigger than my, my refrigerator, uh, but that was a change from the 60s to the 70s. And the 80s, of course, was in when the PC revolution took off and we started working with these small personal computers one-on-one. -on -one. And we also saw the Ethernet standard get defined in the 80s. This, of course, led to the 90s where the World Wide Web just completely took off. And then over the last decade, we've started seeing these small form factor you know, devices that we have in our pockets, which are more powerful than some of these big machines that we had had a long time ago. And that's where um, wireless sensor networks fall. There's a small picture of a wireless sensor node uh, there, which will be the focus of my talk and the research that, that my group does. This uh, figure shows you kind of just historically of some of the developments of these small, tiny wireless sensing uh, devices. And you can see the size of some of them, like the, the Wii C, there's next to a penny. A penny is, about, if you haven't been to the States, a penny is about this big, um, so pretty small. And you can see the spec computer, um, spec device in 2003 that's sitting on a fingertip. So you can see how tiny that little uh, device is. Um, the Telos B was a huge step forward um, because the power consumption of the Telos B was about one-tenth the power consumption of these previous uh, wireless sensing devices. So that was a huge, huge step forward. Um, and then another huge step forward is the Arduino in, as far as ease of programming goes. So I'm sure there's people in, in this uh, audience that probably play with the Arduinos. Yes? Yeah? So some of us, some of us do. Um, some popular uh, wireless moats that are found in various wireless sensor network labs, at least around the United States, uh, are shown here. 
And let's take um, a quick look at the basic architecture of a typical sensor node. So this figure shows the blue box shows the uh, hardware associated with these wireless sensing devices. Uh, so the hardware where you have your eyes and your ears of the sensing device, depending on what type of sensing units that you attach to the, wire, the wireless sensing device. So the blue box is kind of the hardware. The purplish box are the software uh, associated with the device. So some type of micro operating system that's on the um, on these devices, and then the green boxes, of course, show the energy, whether it's battery plug-in or whether you have some type of energy uh, harvesting associated with, um, with, the, with the device. So then you can start asking, okay, so we have these tiny devices, and I should have brought uh, an example moat here, although I know you have some in the labs around here. Um, what can you do with one of these little devices? Well, you can sense things. Uh, you have a microprocessor, so you can compute things. You have a little bit of RAM, so you can store some things. And then if you have a radio attached, you can also communicate. So those are some things you can do with these tiny little devices. So then you can start asking yourself, okay, well, that's one singular device. What can I do if I have a whole network of these devices? Um, we've been surrounded by wired sensor networks for a long time, but moving into this era of having these wireless sensor devices opens up a lot more uh, applications that become really, really interesting. So for example, um, I'm going to classify some of these examples into two big categories. One is you can monitor uh, space, such as in California, there's um, several vineyards that are doing agricultural monitoring with these small wireless sensing devices. That is really cool. Basically what they're doing is they're monitoring the plants and then they give the plants water when the plant needs water. Or they give the plant fertilizer when the plant needs, you don't water every morning at 6 a.m. No, you water when the plant needs water, you fertilize when the plant needs fertilizer. Um, and there are several vineyards in California, uh, from my understanding, that are really jumping on, on this type of technology, so that's really cool. There's also things um, happening where we're watching for hazardous events, such as volcano monitoring uh, that is being done. So these are a couple applications of monitoring the space. You can also monitor things and start asking questions that we've never been able to ask before, thanks to these small little wireless sensor devices. So for example, there's one um, deployment that occurred uh, to monitor these small petrel seabirds, tiny seabirds that live on uh, Duck Island off the east coast of the United States, and we tried to study these seabirds in the past, scientists have tried to study them in the past, and have been unsuccessful, because they realized that when humans are on this, you know, deserted island for 15 minutes, then the mortality rate of the, the eggs for the next generation of the birds goes down by 20%. So these birds want nothing to do with humans. But we are able, the scientists were able to put these small wireless sensing devices out on the island and monitor these birds and learn more about these birds than we've ever been able to learn before and ask really interesting questions that uh, have never been able to be answered. So you can monitor living things such as um, the birds as well as people. There's a whole new field of research that started a few years ago on body sensor networks and a lot more research is being done there. So these are monitoring living things. Well, you can also start monitoring um, non-living things, such as uh, bridges. Uh, there's a couple bridges in the United States that have been instrumented with the wireless sensor network in order to monitor for uh, structural integrity, um, to try to avoid things like that happening as this bridge um, in Minnesota. So the list goes on and on, and this leads to the research that I do. So I kind of fall into the middle area where we are monitoring uh, things. 
Um, the specific program where I work is a program that's called Smart Geo. And what Smart Geo is, is it's an interdisciplinary graduate program in the area of intelligent geosystems. So you might ask, okay, well, what is an intelligent geosystem? So let me first define exactly what that is. An intelligent geosystem is a natural or engineered earth system. So things like bridges, underground tunnels, earth dams and levees, things that we build that interface with the earth, that's a geosystem. And then how do you make that geosystem intelligent? Well, you would deploy or instrument it with a wireless sensor network to sense what's happening with the geosystem and then adapt uh, to improve the objective of the geosystem. So that's what Smart Geo uh, focus is. As I mentioned, it is an interdisciplinary uh, research group. And so we have several uh, technical disciplines that we work with within this group. Um, I've highlighted the most important discipline in the list, right? Computer science. Uh, and I say that a little bit of tongue in cheek, but we certainly learned that when we started working on the applications uh, within this program, every team needed a computer scientist. Every team. No other discipline did we come to the conclusion that needed um, in every single team. Uh, so I think there's some, some truth to that. So let me tell you some of the applications that fall within the Smart Geo program at the Colorado School of Mines, because there's lots of applications. We work on three or four, depending on uh, who's counting. Um, so let me tell you briefly um, about three of these applications. I'll just go over really brief, brief, briefly, and then talk about one in a little bit more depth. Uh, within the Smart Geo program, where we are, quote, working to make the world a better place, um, all of these applications have common features. Uh, they work, in the typical monitoring of the geosystem, the current state, is using a wired geophysical network. So they're using geophysical techniques such as seismic, self-potential, resistivity, and I really like saying resistivity because it took me a while to learn how to say it. <laughs> resistivity, so you might hear me say it a few times. Thank you, resistivity, yeah. I'm very good at saying that now. Um, so you monitor, you collect geophysical data, such as resistivity, um, and in a wired network. And it's periodic. So a team of geophysicists would go out there to whatever geosystem, an earth dam, for example, and collect the data in one stop and then walk away. Our goal is to monitor in a much more continuous manner. We can't, I go continuous because we can't monitor 24 seven because the energy to do that would just be obscene. Uh, but we would like to be more continuous than what the current monitoring practice um, is. So to monitor these geophysical techniques with a wireless sensor network. So as I mentioned, we work in a couple different areas. For example, uh, in the intelligent construction area, um, oh, I should mention, in both of these areas, we are also working with teams um, around the world collect, using their data to try to help them understand what their data means. So looking at their data to try to help them uh, predict some type, of, some type of metric. So for example, in intelligent um, construction, we collaborate with a construction company in Seattle that is building the U-Link to connect Capitol Hill to University of Washington. And we're working with them and analyzing their data to try to see if we can figure out uh, how to predict how quickly the tunnel boring machine can move based on the given situation. Uh, in intelligent avalanche monitoring, we're working with uh, researchers at the Institute for Snow and Avalanche uh, Research, which I think that's, can you imagine working at the Institute for Snow and uh, Avalanche Research? Uh, that just sounds like a cool institute to work for. Uh, it's in Davos, Switzerland, and we work with researchers there collaborating with their data, uh, looking at their data to try to see if we can classify whether an avalanche has, has occurred or not. And we also have, a, we've developed a wireless uh, sensor node that is actually 
uh, going to collect data this, this coming winter uh, in Davos, Switzerland. So that's pretty cool. Uh, intelligent remediation is another application that we work on. And then I want to spend a few more, few more minutes talking about the intelligent earth dams and levees uh, application to set the stage for some of the challenges that I'll mention towards the end of this talk. So in the United States, we have about 85,000 earth dams and about 200 kilometers of levees, uh, earth levees in the United States. And many of these structures are at or near their intended design life. And so they were built thinking they would last for about 50 years and the average age is about 46. <laughs> and so we're getting very close to when these things are meeting the end of their life. And so there's concern many of these earth dams and levees are going to start failing. Uh, in fact, the American Society of uh, Civil Engineers has identified approximately 15,000 high risk high risk uh, earth dams in the United States. And the U US Bureau of Reclamation would like to monitor these high risk dams because of concern of failure, they would like to monitor them once a year. Unfortunately, about 30% of them haven't been monitored in five years. Why? Because the cost of doing one monitoring is, is so expensive. Now, uh, while our project focuses uh, mainly in the United States, these dams, as you can imagine, exist around the world, such as in Argentina, and also the Netherlands spends a lot of money on research in regards to earth dams and levees, because approximately 20% of the Netherlands land is actually under sea level. So they spend a lot of money, and they have this new uh, Ike Dyke test levy where they do a lot of the research and we recently got a grant to collaborate with the researchers at uh, the Ike Dyke and I thought Andy might want to know, well, where, <laughs> who are you collaborating with? So there's the list. I, gra I snagged a picture of the list of uh, researchers that we're working with on this particular project. I also snagged a picture of my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> she always asks me, did you tell the people about me? Now I can say yes, I did, I did Emma, I told them about you. So let's take a look at how uh, internal erosion happens in a typical earth dam. Um, so let's suppose that the earth dam is blocking water on the left hand side of the earth dam. Leakage usually begins on the downstream downstream side of that inner core. So you can kind of see where, where some internal erosion is starting to happen in the middle picture. And then as time goes on, this internal erosion can slowly lead to this pipe, which then can lead to ultimately dam failure. So what we would like to do is to try to locate this internal erosion that is happening before the pipe begins. And so that's our goal, to lo locate that in the, in the subsurface. A failure can happen anywhere from an hour to, to a couple years from after you start seeing this internal erosion. Uh, so it can happen pretty quickly. Um, and our goal, like I said, is to uh, detect this internal erosion in the subsurface before you have a dam failure, such as this failure that occurred uh, in Idaho, or this example, which was the Katrina uh, levee catastrophe that happened in, in the United States. But basically what we have in the United States is we have very old infrastructure and very outdated monitoring practices. And when you combine those two together, it's a recipe for disaster, right? We have to do a better job. We have to do a better job. So let's take a look at what the current state of practice is to determine the health of an earth dam. Well, the current state is doing, as I mentioned, a wired manual geophysical survey where you send a team of geophysicists out to take a look at the dam. You put on the dam all these wires across the top of the dam and you collect things like self potential and seismic and resistivity uh, data, then you take that data back to the lab. It takes a couple days to do one self potential survey on one dam, a team of geophysicists. 
Um, so as you can imagine, because this happens so irregularly, what happens in current practice as far as telling that a dam failure is occurring is this. You see a hole, dam failure, or this. You start seeing a leakage, dam failure. That's what current practice is like. And in fact, this is a picture of a dam in Australia where they started seeing the leakage and so the whole city that was downstream of that dam had to quickly be evacuated because they were concerned that whole reservoir was going to come uh, flooding the city. So to meet our goal of trying to provide more continuous wireless uh, monitoring of these earth dam, it does require an interdisciplinary team. So the current team members are show, shown on this slide. And in computer science, we're working to in instrument these dams with these, as I started this talk, these small wireless sensing um, devices. So that shows, again, these, one of these devices can sense, compute, store, and transmit. But one issue, major issue we have, is these devices are extremely resource constrained. So that's where a lot of the, res uh, the research comes in, is how can we collect this, the geophysical techniques, this geophysical data, with these very tiny resource constrained uh, devices in order to meet our goals. So I've been talking now for about 20 minutes. Teachers know that it's time for an activity, right? <laughs> so thinking about the 30-year celebration of, uh, of the department here, I thought we would take a look at the top 30 innovations of the last 30 years, according to PBS. A nightly business report on PBS a few years ago uh, came, they had their 30th anniversary. And so they came up with, well, let's look at what are the top 30 innovations over the last 30 years. I am going to just whiz through them. But what I want each of you to do is take a little notch and mark down if a computer scientist was involved. Okay? The top 30 innovation, ask yourself, was the computer scientist involved in this innovation or had something to do to make the innovation important? Okay? Are you ready? Ready? Here we go. So an anti-treatment uh, for AIDS drug. That's number 30. 29, flash memory. 28, stents. 27 ATMs. Now again, mark, mark if you're counting. I'm going to go through them fast. 26 barcodes and scanners. 25 biofuels. 24 genetically modified plants. 23 RFID and applications. 22 digital photography or videography. 21 uh, GUIs. 20, social networking, 19, large-scale wind turbines, 18, solar energy, 17, microfinance, 16, media file compression, 15, e-commerce, GPS, 14, LCDs, 13, LEDs, 12, Open source software was 11. Laser slash robotic surgery made 10. Nine was office software. Eight was fiber optics. Seven was microprocessor. Number six is MRI. Number five is DNA sequencing and mapping. Number four is email. <laughs> Number three, mobile phones. Number two, PC and laptop computers. What do you think number one is? The internet. Number one, the internet. Yeah. All right, raise your hand if you count your little checks. Raise your hand if you have more than 10. Okay, raise your hand if you have more than 20. Ooh, raise your hand if you have more than 25. Raise your hand if you have 30. Yeah, see, these are the smart people. <laughs> I actually, I mean, I haven't gone and studied all these 30. 
but yeah, I think, yeah, computer scientists, I think if you lowballed it, I mean, if you were really, really, really critical, you would come up with 24. But the point being is that computer science, if those are, you know, agreed, this is according to Nightly Business News, but if those are agreed that those are the top 30 innovations of the last 30 years, we have made the world a better place, right? Yay, computing. Yay. Yeah, I love being in computer science. There's so many good things we can talk about, such as my research on intelligent geosystems. So a quick reminder, we're working to try to do wireless geophysical monitoring. So I'd now like to focus a little bit on some of the technical challenges within computer science. There are technical challenges in many of the disciplines that, that I work with, but I'm going to focus, of course, on the ones that are in, in computing. So first of all, one of the problems that we had, and, and each of these challenges that I'm going to mention could be their own talk. You know, so if you want to invite me back, I'm happy to come and could give more talks, and you can see my children grow. Um, <laughs> uh, so let me just focus on a couple of them. So one is we realized those popular moats that I mentioned uh, we could not just connect a geophysical sensor, unfortunately. We wrote that in the proposal. Oops. Um, turned out we were not able to do that because geophysical techniques require uh, many things that we hadn't thought about um, when, when we wrote the proposal, such as they have a very high sampling rate like 500 or 1,000 hertz sampling rate. So they sample very high. They're collecting tons and tons of data. And they need what they're monitoring is um, a very low voltage signal. And so they needed very high precision ADC, for example. And we could not get that with off-the-shelf melts. So the first thing we had to do was develop our own geophysical sensing moat, wireless moat, and we call it appropriately, GS moat for geophysical sensing, if you didn't figure that out on your own. So here's a picture of our uh, printed circuit board, and here's a picture of the front and back of our moat, and here's a picture of my son, because he'll <laughs> kill me if I show you a picture of my daughter and I don't show you a picture of my son, so that's my son. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of the moat, but I know some of you are probably hardware geeks out there, so I'll just leave this up here for just a brief second. Uh, and just tell you that it took us a couple years to develop this moat. We developed it with a local company that is now selling it. And it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so I had another student who said, you know, I could develop a moat a lot faster and a lot cheaper with the Arduino. And Arduinos, as we know, is pretty inexpensive. And so we have a second version of this wireless moat that we call the GeoShield that plugs into the Arduino. And we are just now about to finalize the middleware on these wireless moats. So now we have two wireless platforms, and we're going to be taking them out to the field really soon to compare the, the data that's collected with these two wireless platforms with the, the wired geophysical, which is what the geophysicists currently do. So we're just about to deploy, and I'm hoping that the data that we collect um, is, is similar to the wired, the wired case. So that's where we are with the hardware aspect for collecting the data, for actually sensing the data and collecting it. A second challenge uh, that we work on is we do a lot of processing with the teams that we collaborate with to try to understand the data, such as trying to be able to predict that that noise is an avalanche and not something else that is in, in the environment. And I mention this because I wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit more detail uh, or show you some results from our uh, prediction of avalanches in, in a moment. Uh, but first, you may be wondering where the heck is the Colorado School of Mines. It's a tiny university, so I'm sure lots of you have not yet visited it. I hope you will someday, though. Um, for those that are geographically challenged as far as the United States, there's Colorado. We're kind of in the middle uh, of the country. And here shows a picture of Colorado and the university. Denver is our capital. The university is in Golden. So we're just 20 miles approximately west of uh, Denver, Colorado. 
and we are right in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. It is absolutely beautiful. We get over 300 days of sunshine a year. People think that we're always surrounded by snow, but actually we're not. Because in order for those clouds to get over the 14,000 foot Rockies, they gotta dump all the moisture. So we, we only shovel a couple times a year. You guys hear about us when some cloud snakes through and then dumps two feet. That happens a couple times a decade. But it doesn't happen that much. So anyways, uh, come visit me if you have a sabbatical or you're just traveling in, in uh, the United States. Feel free to come visit me. Like I said, it's really, really beautiful there. Okay, so now that we've had another little short break, now let's get into some technical um, details. I wanted to tell you a little bit more about this particular challenge that we've been working with because this is relatively new technology and I think it's really cool and I hope, you know, everybody should hear about it. Has, have, has anybody here read anything about compressive sampling or compressive sensing? So one per, this stuff is really cool, really cool. So pay attention, okay, you ready? All right, so in our application, Smart Geo application, we have very high sampling rates. And these moats have very limited resources associated with them. And so one of the things we wanted to think about was <coughs> reducing the, how can we reduce the amount of data that we need to, need to collect? And so one of the collaborators on the team said, well, maybe we should look into this compressive sampling thing. The theory from compressive sampling, here's a quote from one of the founders of the field, is you know, with compression, what you do with compression is you take all the data and then you compress it, right? And his point was, why go to all the effort to acquire all this data when most of it's gonna get thrown away in the compression? So maybe we ought to think about, instead of sample all the data, then compress, maybe we should compress while we're sampling so we can save a lot of resources and not collect all this data. Uh, here's a URL for a repository of papers. Many papers have been written about compressive sampling over the last few years, so there's a repository if you would like to read more. Um, okay, so I have about eight minutes. Okay, so I think I can go into a little bit of detail. I'm a scientist. I felt like I ought to have one equation up there, but don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. Uh, we won't go into too much. I'll do some hand-waving. Um, basically, compressive sampling, how it works is that the original signal has to have low information. So what that means, for example, is the signal has to be sparse. It can be sparse in the time domain, it can be sparse in the frequency domain, it can be sparse in the time frequency domain. Doesn't matter where it is sparse, but the signal must be sparse in some domain, and then you, as the domain scientist, have to figure out where the signal uh, is sparse in order for compressive sampling uh, to work. One paper I read, which um, I, I think is actually interesting to think about, although I haven't, I mean, I haven't, you know, been able to validate this, but one paper I read said that all interesting signals are sparse. <laughs> the problem is just figuring out what domain it's sparse within. But if that's true, if all interesting signals are sparse, then compressive sampling might be able to save us a lot of uh, energy that we expend in, in collecting all this uh, data. So how does compressive sampling work? Well, basically what it does is it transforms the original signal, which is of length n, to a vector of length y, by multiplying it by a measurement matrix, which is M by N. Now this measurement matrix has to have certain properties associated with it. Um, so for example, um, phi, this measurement matrix, has to be maximally incoherent to the sparsity domain uh, psi. So it has to have certain properties. But the good news is there's many measurement matrix out there that fit uh, the properties, so that's good. And I'm just gonna hand wave over those details and instead jump into the signal recovery. So then how signal recovery works, so instead of having this big signal, instead you just have this smaller Y, well you know your measurement matrix, 
And then you use um, uh, something like uh, an algorithm called L1 norm minimization to, to get back to the original signal. And so, for example, uh, this, if you want to look at the math, well, no, actually, let's just eh, hand wave over that. And instead, I only have a few minutes left, get into the results. But basically, it's using um, compressive sampling, is using uh, numerical, linear numerical optimization techniques in order to recover the original signal. So it's ground in theory, which is, you know, interesting in theory, but then the question might be, does it work in practice, right? And so we wanted to see, does compressive sampling work with the seismic data that we had gotten collected uh, from the avalanches in Switzerland that we collected using a wired sensor network uh, data over a whole winter period. So we had a lot of data uh, of avalanches during one whole season in Switzerland, at least on some of these main avalanche paths. And so we had, uh, there's three algorithms out there. RTV is our algorithm. ARS and SBS are two algorithms that we found in the literature um, that these algorithms are compressive sampling algorithms that work on a small, tiny moat, okay? Now, the data, we kind of fudged a little bit for ARS and SBS because those algorithms, when you just implement them directly on the moat, it turned out they, they didn't work. Uh, SBS, for example, how SBS works is it collects all the data and then compresses. And on a moat, we don't have infinite memory, right? We have very limited memory. And so SBS actually doesn't work in our environment that has a very high sampling frequency. Um, ARS doesn't work because it, it has to collect a Gaussian um, number in order to tell the next interval to do the data collection. And at a high sampling rate, the time it took to create the Gaussian number was longer than the sampling rate. Uh, so that didn't work either. So the numbers for ARS and SBS are, are just kind of fictional numbers as if they would work. Uh, and that's why we developed RTV. But the good news about RTV is it you know, offers results very close to the other algorithms that, that are available. And this is the compressive sampling percentage. So this says we only collect 30% of the data. Then the y-axis gives you the normalized root mean squared error from the full signal. And you can see here the error is not that large with 30% of the data. So then you might ask yourself, okay, I only have to collect 30% of the data instead of collecting all the data, but is that 30% going to be uh, useful? And the good news is uh, we were able to use that workflow with the machine learning algorithm that I mentioned a few minutes ago in order to see if we can classify avalanches. So here's the, the sampling percentage, so here's 30% of uh, collecting the data, and this shows the accuracy, you can see at about 70% we're very close to full sampling. With full sampling with our workflow, we were able to get almost 93% accuracy, and we were actually really excited about that for predicting avalanches. Uh, the best that we found in the literature was about 85%. So we were excited we could predict close to 93% with uh, the, the techniques we were using. And then we were excited with 70% of the data, you can almost get what you can with full sampling. But then a little bit more work, 30% of the data, we can get just 1.7% off of full sampling for predicting avalanches. So that's the good news. Sounds like, woohoo, maybe we've won there, but actually not quite yet. Uh, we haven't figured out how to implement that um, algorithm on a little moat, <laughs> so we're still working on that. It's a better algorithm, but it requires a bit more um, uh, a bit more resources to work. So we're still working on how can we get that algorithm onto our our little moat. Uh, but basically, the main takeaway here is compressive sampling is feasible within our domain within Smart Geo. So maybe compressive sampling might be useful in your uh, field as well, uh, but we still have a lot of challenges to implement this goal of intelligent uh, geosystems. 
So let me just, two last things. I always like to mention my students. I wouldn't be uh, standing here today if it wasn't for my students. And some result within this presentation are thanks to those three. I, I work with some really awesome students. And then I'll just close with this quote. It's kind of similar to that.